She is a senior staff writer for The Ringer, and she is the New York Times bestselling author of Giannis, The Improbable Rise of an NBA MVP. We welcome Marin Fader onto Hoopsology. How's it going, Marin? Hey, thank you for having me. I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for coming on to the show. We've been looking forward to talking to you about this book. Just all the buzz, all the feedback, just such a knowledgeable read. And I wanted to ask you, Marin, basically from when you first conceptualized the idea of the book till now with all the feedback and all the success of the Milwaukee Bucks, what does this have been your feelings overall just seeing kind of Giannis's journey from, you know, you just laying out kind of the, the blueprint for this book to now him, you know, being finals MVP, being in NBA champion, just a journey he's been on. Can you kind of just give your feelings on what's transpired since the book's been released? Yeah, I never thought they would win the championship. <laughs> um, this has been a very pleasant surprise. Um, when I first um, met him in the family, it was 2019. So I don't even think he had his first um, MVP of the league then. And so I just feel like everything has accelerated so quickly. And um it was perfect timing, I think, that he decided to stay and for them to have that storybook ending. When I proposed the book, we had no idea if he was going to stay in Milwaukee or not. So that was really tricky as a writer, like, how am I going to end this thing? Um, so I think the way it ended and, and everything that they were able to accomplish just made it that much more interesting for me as a writer to kind of dig into. Marin, can you kind of go over this Giannis's mentality um, just based on his upbringing to now in terms of his perception in the league, because I just feel like compared to other superstars, he doesn't get his just due. I mean, if you put mm-hmm. his resume to a player that's born in America, I think he's far more popular. But yet, and not only that, just his personality too, just when you see him in the pregame, Warren almost says everything he's done outside of basketball as, as well. I think he's very friendly to just a casual basketball audience as well. But yeah, I think just with the media and just kind of hardcore basketball fans, I don't think he's put in that class of the elite players, even though he should. Um, it's kind of somewhat kind of begrudgingly sometimes. Can you kind of pinpoint kind of why that is? And do you think you see that ever changing in the future? Yeah, it's so weird, right? Like, we are witnessing greatness, and we are not appreciating it. Um, Rob Mahoney Mm -hmm. at The Ringer, my colleague, had an amazing story about this a couple days ago. He was just like, Yana should be in this conversation. I don't understand. Personally, it's just my perspective. I think um, some of it is is just flat-out xenophobia and, you know, these conversations. Can he be the face of the league if he's not from here? And you don't see that happening with Aluka. Um, so I think it's, it's really has to do with that. Um, I think also Giannis himself does not like the limelight. So he turns down opportunities. Like he could be, he could just have every deal and he doesn't choose to, to put himself out there. He's so focused on his team and winning. So I think it's a combination of factors, but I just cannot understand when people say that he wouldn't thrive in other eras or he's not this or he's not that. I'm like, I have never seen somebody with the combination of skill and accomplishment that this guy has. And the fact that he's a, just a nice human being. I just, I've never seen all of those things line up like that. 100% agree. And and you look at uh, like like folks like Justin and myself, uh, we were raised on basketball, like 90s basketball. And one of the things, whether it's myth or reality, is players being like loyal to teams was something of, of great value in that era. And you see Giannis kind of standing apart from the rest of the crowd in staying with Milwaukee. Uh, do you think some of that also may have to do, I mean, aside from the potential of, of xenophobia, how much of that would you say is being in a small market? Um, you know, I mean, we we live in the age of social media and information traveling very quickly. So maybe small market is less of a factor. But how much do you think that weighs in in that comparison of maybe a lesser brand of, of Giannis compared to other stars with his accolades? 
I mean, I do think the small market is very much a big part of it, but I think it's the small market and the the people that are part of this organization. Like he just had a different type of relationship with the people that run the bucks and not even that run the bucks, like the intern that taped his knees, you know, eight years ago, like he was so close to every member of this organization. And I don't think you find those close ties in a bigger market team. Um, they really, um, I enjoyed working on the the sort of first half of the book more than the second half because you saw like the GM, John Hammond, almost act like a father figure. They nurtured him and helped him grow up into a man. And I just think like I understand the loyalty because they were so loyal to him. He was so needing friendship and guidance and, you know, just overall help um, is very hard to come over and do what he did as young as he was. So I think that it's just they were so loyal to him and he wanted to rep- you know reciprocate that is that something that you see with you know your experience covering the league and and writing about several different players um is that something that seems unique to Milwaukee or just unique to Giannis's situation in particular is there things from the book and and how that organization te- uh treated Giannis that other franchises could uh learn from I think this was a rare situation where it was the perfect storm. Not only did they have the personnel, but they literally were terrible at at basketball and they won 15 games. (laughs) (laughs) So that really helps because you get individual attention and nothing's really at stake and you can just go in and make mistakes. So I will say like it was the perfect storm, but I've seen the development that they and the care that they gave him in little pockets like i i profiled brandon ingram and he was extremely close with uh, a lakers assistant who i think is with okc now and that guy would just shoot with him all the time it was like a dad type of you know figure so i think that a lot of the player development as well as assistant coaches they do get really tight with the players and they do form those relationships but i just an organization wide thing where everyone is making sure that the the player is okay and their family has keys to the gym. I have never seen that before. Um, I definitely think that organizations should do that, especially if you have somebody coming overseas and in this world, there's going to be so much more of them. So um, one of the things that I thought um, John Hammond, the former GM, who's now the, uh, the magic GM said was that one of the reasons that Darko Milicic did not succeed and Hammond would know this because he was in, um, Detroit when Darko Mm -hmm. was selected was because he just didn't have a support system here at all. And so he sort of learned from that and did things with Giannis a bit differently. So I just think that was so beneficial. Coming off of that point, do you see other international players coming overseas, um, being treated better just based on, you know, kind of that, you know, the pitfalls Darko went through and Giannis's success. Is there pretty much a system in place that you have, you know, noticed in terms of international players coming into the league and not only just dealing with just all the pressures of being, you know, a top pick, but also just a culture shock of just playing in a different country? Has there been, has the NBA adapted better just based on these different stories you've referenced? I definitely think it's so much better. And I think it's only going to get better because now there's just the expectation that like, okay, a majority of our all-stars will be not from here. Like there's been such a seismic shift. And I think that teams are now so much more um, accommodating, whether it's language or even just little things like, you know, learning about how it was difficult for Giannis to just even know how to get transportation, where to go. You know, it was a different era then, of course, but I do think that they are so much better with it. And the NBA is trying so hard to find the next uh, international superstar in uh, places that you wouldn't expect. I I did a piece on um, the NBA's efforts to find a basketball superstar in India, a place that really isn't traditionally known for basketball. And they've invested so many camps and academies and coaches and all these things. It's like there's a real hunt to find the next Giannis wherever. Um, Australia has this... um, academy there that wasn't there before um africa there's so many different academies in africa that that were not there given this new pro league that's happening there as well so i just think that it's we need to appreciate people like Giannis and their journey because that is going to be so normal i guess in the next you know and it's it's been normal obviously he was not the first i'm aware of dirk and everyone um that paved the way but 
yeah, it's definitely getting better. You, you brought up India. That is very interesting just because, you know, Matt and I were born and raised in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We grew up with a lot of Australians, um, you know, playing for, you know, New Mexico. And then we've seen New Mexico State um, getting, you know, some African players there. And I just want to ask you, how, what is the NBA development in India? Because I just hear about Australia, the game is booming there. Africa, the game is booming there. Europe. But India, you don't hear too much about um, that part of the world in terms of basketball. So is there yeah. actually development going on? Or can you kind of shed some light? That's really interesting. Yes. Oh my God. I loved working on this story. So I, um, yes, there is so much, uh, resources being poured. So basically like maybe a decade ago, there wasn't any academies, there wasn't any leagues, there wasn't anything, there weren't coaches and they decided to put a league office there and, um, just searching for players. And there were some good players here and there, but it wasn't enough to have like an academy and slowly, more and more kids started coming in and they have um, really interesting issues with weather and monsoons. And so they needed kind of an indoor sport, but um, little things like in their gym, um, I think it's called Ludiana, like birds fly through. It's not your traditional, you know, five-star gym, but what they're building is so beautiful and important. And um, the profile that I wrote about Prince uh, was this guy named Principal Singh, who was the best basketball player to come from there. And they thought he was going to make the NBA this year. He was on the G League Ignite team. And it was fascinating. He had never heard of basketball. He told me, like, I didn't have an internet connection. Like, I didn't have a phone. I'm just in this rural town in India where everyone at the village is, like, 500 people or something. And so to see the growth from like him growing up, not even having a conception of basketball to him learning who LeBron is and envisioning a dream bigger than himself, none of that would have ever happened without the NBA's investment in these academies. He's just a real beneficiary of that. I believe he signed to play in Australia. He did not make the NBA this year, but they are trying so hard to find that next superstar because you're right. Like we don't hear about these other countries, but to hear the stories of the the men that have moved over there and dedicated years of their lives to developing a sport in a country that's just not the sport is it's really special and you'll never hear those guys names but they work so hard is there just a natural curiosity in India for that sport of basketball? I mean, what is your your sense of the the public perception? I mean, my understanding is there's a, a huge cricket following, right. um, a huge cricket <laughs> yeah. community in India. But is it is it easy to pull people away and, and say like, hey, come try this sport? You know, with the development of those gyms, what's kind of the the perception of basketball out there? At first, there really wasn't much perception. There's been like a couple players, but you could be in a, a, you know, a distant town and have never heard of the game. Now, like they're building new courts, like uh, the the man I just mentioned, um, they're going to build the first ever gym in his town. Um, it's little things like that that are happening all over the country. And now there's so many kids that enjoy basketball. There was one anecdote in the piece where I think they had a championship game and they invited pretty much everyone in the town to go. And it was just filled with kids cheering for basketball. And it was a scene that you just never would think would happen <laughs> in India 10 years prior, you know? So it's just, there's a lot of excitement over there. It was really cool. And I, I was, I got to know my, uh, my translator really well. Um, and he was just saying like, it's such an emerging sport. You know, it's one of those things where I feel like we're going to check back in 10 years and see even more growth. Absolutely. Um, along those same lines, do you have a sense of Greece's interest in the NBA before and after Giannis and, and the success he's had in the league? Has, has he had a major pull on that country uh, to support the NBA? He's definitely had a major pull, but Greeks have loved basketball for so much longer than before Giannis. Like the Greeks are, I'm not going to say the word crazy, but it's, <laughs> it is intense. Okay. Like I thought we were intense over here. They like throw flares during the games. Like, <laughs> oh my goodness. You will just, yeah, you will see like straight up fire on the court. Like, like people will throw <laughs> quarters at you. Like if there has been like actual attacks between fans and police having to come and break it up, like basketball is religion in Greece and, um, Olympiacos <laughs> and Panathinaikos are these two teams that just are amazing and they kill it at Euro league. And they've just been going back and forth for years. So I think what's so fascinating about the Giannis effect is obviously the entire country is just so, um, 
behind him, not the entire, there's obviously, as you can see in the book, like quite a bit of racism there, but most people do love him and embrace him, but Mm -hmm. he never played for their top two teams. So it's fascinating because he is not the traditional Greek superstar. And yet the NBA wanted to look at him, somebody who couldn't make those top two teams because he wasn't a citizen, because his game fit the NBA game, which was he was athletic. He was, you know, he had the length, he had the speed um, and he could play there versus a lot of the Greek legendary players never really got that shot. And maybe in some ways an advantage that uh, the the opponents of whatever team he potentially could have played for in Greece, he he never had to cause that division between the <laughs> fandom. So maybe maybe he's kind of unifying in that way that he just jumped right to the NBA. Thank God, because <laughs> <laughs> you never know at those games. <laughs> Marin, I wanted to ask you in terms of Giannis's effect with the Milwaukee Bucks and the Milwaukee community. Can you kind of go over kind of what the community thinks of Giannis in terms of just not only winning the title, but just, I guess, adopting him and just ingratiating to you? You talked about the organization, but can you kind of go over just the fans just embracing him? Like, what's the just interactions with him and just kind of the fan base like? Yeah, no, I love this question and the word community because it's it's – it's really, it's critical. Um, they feel like they've watched him grow up like a son because they did. He was just this gangly teenager that came over and they watched him grow up into this chiseled, powerful Goliath type man. And um, they watched him make mistakes. They watched him get better. They watched him, you know, defend their city. Giannis was like the first athlete, I would say, in terms of basketball players to publicly say positive things about the city of Milwaukee. They are so used to players bagging, oh man, like I got mm. traded to the Bucks. <laughs> I gotta go to the Bucks. <laughs> you know, and like Giannis was the- <laughs> Giannis was like, I love Milwaukee. What a great city. And so, you know, they they are so used to the superstar leaving, you know, the legacy of Kareem Abdul Jabbar having left for the Lakers and I think the fact that Giannis, even before Giannis stayed, just the fact that he said, I love this city, just endeared him forever to the city of Milwaukee. And so there's just a special bond that the two have that I just I have not seen at any other fan base. You know, it's so unique. It's so pure. And um, if you go to Pfizer Forum, you go up to anyone, you ask them, why do you love Giannis? And they will just talk for hours. Everyone's got a story. Everyone has a reason why they love him. It's It's very unique. Absolutely. I, I think the other thing uh, that was really endearing to me, and one of the reasons, even though I'm not a Bucks fan, I, I root for Giannis is, you know, his interviews in last year's postseason where he talks about how much he loves playing with Chris Middleton, how much he loves his teammates as well. That sense of community that he's built on that team is so unique. Uh, you mentioned earlier, you know, how supportive the Bucks have been kind of raising uh, Giannis in that franchise. Uh, I wanted to ask your thoughts on the league as a whole is is there anything more that they could do to um push Giannis's brand kind of to the top because i i just think he has so many i i mean obviously the physical skill that he has and the the freaky athletic things he can do is is apparent you just watch highlights that's easy to see um but is there a certain obligation and are there certain things that the nba could do better to uh make his brand ascend Yeah. I mean, I am just, I was just shocked that when I started this book, there was hardly anything on his childhood other than one Mm. sentence, sold trinkets on the street. I mean, there's literally nothing on that. Like you can't Google Giannis's childhood friends, Giannis's high school, Giannis's elementary school. There's nothing. Mm. I had to like figure this out. And so I just think, honestly, just my opinion, I think it's been a massive failure for the NBA to not push his story more, whether that's documentary, um, you know, I mean, and I and I think what they need to do is also position him to the Nigerian audience. They do so much Greek outreach, but like Giannis's whole Nigerian side is so important and it's such a big part of his identity. And I know from the people in the hoops community over there that I talked to, they want a better relationship with him and his story. They embrace him as well. So I just think that I, I just wish they would tell all aspects of his story and his identity and um you can never have enough like there's all there's so many anecdotes with this guy like there there he just is so um 
whenever people say like he's not marketable, I'm like he's actually the most marketable person I've ever seen. <laughs> he's like right. genuinely mm-hmm. nice. He could make friends with a caterpillar. He's <laughs> just like a very like perfect bubbly, you know. So I I just think they need to put him put him out there more. And maybe he doesn't want to be. I don't know. But I I just think that um, his story is so inspiring and can reach a lot of people. Yeah, that's the other thing too that you bring up is, I mean, this this huge story of overcoming adversity, overcoming all these obstacles, and ascending the way he has. I, I just think universally to the human experience, that's that's huge and something that everyone can get behind. Well, and I think that's why people in Milwaukee are so obsessed with him because you know it is a for most parts a, a blue car blue collar place excuse me and they respect the work ethic and the grind and um he has those kind of midwest values and um look like none of us really have much in common with him i am not seven feet tall i am five feet tall and but i i see his hunger and his drive and i i I want to emulate that. Um, somebody who is not from Greece is like, wow, I really love the way you, you know, take care of your brothers and respect your mother. I want to emulate that. Like there are aspects of his, his life and his story that are so interesting and universal that you can have nothing in common with him and take from it. Marin, we really appreciate the time. Thanks for coming on to the podcast. Can you please let our viewers and listeners know where they can find you on social media and then where they can also um, pick up a copy of the book as well? Yes. Well, I want to say thank you guys so much for having me on. And I'm sorry it took me so long. Um, This was really, this was so fun. And I really appreciate just the thoughtfulness that you both brought to your questions. Um, Yes, I am just at Marin Fader, M I R I N F A D E R. And the paperback's coming out uh, April 10th through 12th-ish, around mid-April. And it has a new chapter because the Bucks went and won the championship and I had to write. Um, So I hope people (laughs) pick it up. (laughs) If you want to support an indie bookstore, that would be great. Um, I know the ones near me, Skylight and Chevaliers, uh, I think they still have signed copies. Um, But yeah, I just appreciate if people pick it up. Awesome, Marin. Thank you very much for coming on to the podcast. Thank you, guys.